right moment, a gun day, the first one is 1966, Sam Oli, then senior university, three years ago, the presented himself at Capitol Square Church. He was stopped by ushers who blocked his way. I don't know how that house should be over to God's children. When he insisted he be admitted, he was seized by two men of the church. One applied a headlock on him, and the other dragged him down the steps. The church had voted 286 to 109 last summer to remain segregated. Combustible. 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 Burr. The Judeo Christian ethic is simply the old New Testament teachings as we understand them and apply them. Capsulized, as it were. Love God. Love others as yourself. The word love here meaning agape. Caring love. Just caring love. And in a day and age here in Macon, that for a hundred years the communities black and white have been separated. Judeo-Christian ethic for us would be enlarged to understand that these two communities ought to be one in spirit, attitude, helpfulness, and caring love back and forth. And that was a hard lesson for us whites especially to learn. From making newspapers, letters, and sermons, 1950 to 1963. Dear Christian believers, we believe it a crime directed at God advocate integration or to support it and not speak up for segregation. The basic requirement God set up for his holy people was racial segregation. Deuteronomy 73. Thou art an holy people. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his son shalt thou take unto thy daughter. It is evident that God's wish was separation of the race. Acts 17, 26. Thou hast made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the bounds of their habitation. It is only when certain members of the one race or the other have stepped out of the bounds of their habitation that they had trouble. Jesus taught inequality among men. Jesus taught discerning love. Racial segregation as a social organization fits that pattern. Save our churches in our country from communist-inspired integration. You may, as a segregationist, know that what your experience, instinct, and intellect have told you is right in racial relations, is also a Christian. Christian. If you agree with these principles, please sign and forward to your pastor. <laughs> the Baptist faith was originally simply an expression or outburst of what our founders spoke of as soul S O U L Liberty. Soul Liberty. Soul Liberty. Soul liberty. Soul liberty! Soul liberty. Soul liberty. Freedom. The privilege of interpreting scriptures for ourselves under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, which begot the idea that each person is his or her own priest, as it were, before God. You don't need the intermediary efforts of church or clergy. We never had creedal statements. Never. And a blank line, now sign right here, that's so unbaptist. Freedom of scriptural interpretation always. And that has been both a blessing and a bane, in Baptist life especially. For when we were fighting some of the battles in the 50s with local preachers or denominational leaders and so on, each side would claim, Well, I'm just following my own conscience here. <laughs> you know, this is the way I read the Bible. And there's hardly any comeback to that once you announce that's where you stand. So, it was rough. But, um, it was, again, just soul liberty. S-O-U-L. Soul liberty. Freedom. I must have inherited a kind of intellectual interest in things. Questions always interested me, and it never occurred to me that I was wrong in raising questions. I remember my sophomore year, this freshman student coming up to me and saying, I just want to tell you that I belong to a small prayer group, and we pray for you every week. And I said, well, why are you praying for me? Well, you're asking questions that shouldn't be asked. Saying things that shouldn't be said. 
I wasn't aware of that. Somebody else was. And it became clear to me in my first year in the seminary that I really was thinking thoughts and asking questions that were outside of the mainstream of fundamentalism. And I remember really being agitated by this because at that time, in that kind of conservative environment and, and fundamentalist environment, liberals were people who were damned and going to hell. And I seemed to be moving in that direction. So I was going to hell. I think only a fundamentalist can appreciate the agony that that creates, you know? I remember going to God, going to bed, praying to God, something like this. Dear God, I think I'm becoming a liberal. <laughs> and if I do, that means I'll go to hell, so I'd rather die tonight and go to heaven and be with you than to go on living and become a real liberal. <laughs> and go to hell. <laughs> now do you feel the agony in that? <laughs> but I've often used the illustration that once you start thinking critically, it's, it's like getting on a ski jump. Once you start down on your skis, you can't stop in the middle. Once you start thinking and raising questions that are outside of the mainstream of fundal fundamentalism, you can't stop. There's nothing that's going to stop you. My father was a lay Baptist minister in Eady Creek, and uh, he got someone from Atlanta who provided him with a tent, and he started a church. It was extremely conservative, fundamentalist Baptists. You know, the Presbyterians, I remember. The Catholics, well, well, there were no Catholic churches, but they had heard of Catholics, and uh, they were uh, damned to hell. You know, everyone except for the Baptists who thought of they did it. And I remember being uh, shocked in myself, because when I was in high school, I would hear them talking about how the Methodists, no matter how well intended they were, and the Presbyterians over there in Clayton, well, well, they were all going to hell. And I thought, I was maybe 15, I thought, I can think of a God bigger than that. I can think of a God. 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 Bigger than that. And that was very disturbing to me. But that's when my life opened up, and I, I started questioning things. And when I got to Mercer, the situation was just perfect for me to, to revel in this new world. And that's where I met Mac Bryan. Steve McLeod Bryant, tall and thin. Real skinny. He's always been just a shadow. He was a gangly guy, a big Adam's apple. He was the Ichabod Crane of, of Mercer. Wild haired, wild eyed. We called him. Nah. Mac. Mac taught Christian ethics at Mercer University. He was forever uh, debunking the sacred, the sacred cows of cracker society. Mm -hmm. We had one white boy in our Christian ethics class who was in a wheelchair. And there was a young black man who pushed him from class to class. And he wasn't allowed to come into our classroom. He had to wait out in the hallway while we had our Christian ethics class. And I could see he was a bright fella. And he had a lot of intellectual curiosity about him. I would get to talking with him out in the hall, and the students were coming in before class, and he was not able to go to college. So I simply said to him one day, look, it's ridiculous for you to stand out in the hall when, when there's plenty of room in the classroom, and all you have to do is come in and just be a part of the class. And so we put it to a vote. And we voted that the young black man who had to stand in the hallway should stay in the class with us and learn something, rather than have to go in the hallway and stand. Well. It didn't take 24 hours for that to get back to the administration. <laughs> and uh, at the end of the evening, Dr. Bryan was notified that there were uh, calls coming in from trustees and others around the state that uh, that could not be tolerated. And that was immediately taboo. They didn't say a thing to me. They said to the student, don't you go back in that classroom again. So he's the victim. I thought to myself, this is the college I want to go to. 
I didn't know the name of the college, but on the way back, I saw that it was Mercer University. And I said to myself, I'll go to Mercer University. When I got home, my mother said, get that out of your head. You're a black child, and that's a white school. And I felt crushed. So that was the world of Mercer that we knew. And it was the world of separate but equal. Mac had students come over to his house once or twice a week in the evening to talk about social injustices and segregation. So every Wednesday night, <coughs> we'd have these meetings. And I'd usually try to bring in people from all over the world. And on this particular night, two black missionaries from the Southern Baptist Missionary Society came by the house. I said, come on in. Have a seat until the students get here. OK, the students came. And uh, my wife picked supper for this crowd. And uh, for most of these students, it was the first time they ever ate socializing as equals with blacks. Well, the students had gone home. And before midnight, the phone rang. And Mercer University's president's on the other line. Of course, this never happens. When you hear the call from a top administrator, if Mercer's president were to call you at midnight, you'd know something was up. Mac, I heard you had a Negro at the house. Uh, that's what he said. Mac, I heard you had a Negro. Well, I said, yes, Mr. President, it certainly did. Well, what's the problem? And he said, well, I had trustees calling me, and they want to know what I'm going to do about it. See, I mean, see, the, the president was under pressure constantly about, you know, this kind of behavior from some conservative power structure. I said, Mr. President, I said, would you, if two Southern Baptist missionaries come by your house and they didn't have a place to have supper, would you feed them? Did you feed them? Yes, we have a group of students in every Wednesday night. We eat together. You had students? Yes, we had students. Well, that's, I think, how the trustees found out about it. One of the trustees' daughters was in the group. And uh, she left early and went to a music concert, as I found out. And she blurted out to her uncle that, you know? I just had the greatest experience in my life. I ate with a Negro. <gasps> <laughs> and, uh, of course, he said, Young lady, that was the worst thing that's ever happened to you. And I'm going to see if I can stop it. So things like that began working immediately. I mean, that's how fast it worked from, you know, 5 o'clock to 12 o'clock. And the president's caught in the middle of that. How did you feed them all? Well, my wife fixed the meal and people will bring in meals. To Do you sit them. down? No. You didn't sit down. No, we, uh, we don't have enough room. Well, that's all I needed to know. And he hung up. <laughs> now, notice he did not defend me. Not the least bit. All he did was he took the oldest Southern defense that you do not eat sitting down with the black. <laughs> if it just so happens that you're standing up and the black's standing up and eat with you, that's a happenstance. And <laughs> he argued to the trustee. I didn't call that a defense at all. <laughs> <coughs> I had a playmate who happened to be white. And I guess this was preschool, so I was four or five years old or so. And we were playing during the daytime. And I remember his mother telling us we had to come in and have lunch. And he, of course, invited me along. And I remember his mother directing me to the back porch. And I didn't know why at the time. And I was wondering in my own little mind, while we were playing together, and doing all of the things we did together, and when it was time for us to have lunch, he went inside, and I went to the back porch. You know, the craziest thing in the world. I was not able to eat at the table of my young friend. And the same lady had a black woman in her kitchen cooking her food. Now think about that. If you do that against having people of color in your midst, and you trust them well enough to prepare your food. So, 